Oh boy, that break was a little longer than I wanted. What am I going to talk about? Oh, Nala. Mm. How'd she find me? I... Curse my love of pumpkin spice lattes. It's I, your queen of fall. Oh God. It has been a year. Yeah, it sure has been, hasn't it? Usually you're the first to welcome my return, sometimes as early as late August. Yeah, about that. But this year you haven't even returned my calls. Uh, well, to be fair, I am a millennial and we don't believe in, you know, phones. Have you even had a pumpkin beer yet? I've been trying to cut back on booze. Are you seeing another season? Okay, look, I, I'll be honest with you. I started a new job in the summer, and I'm just really trying to keep things from getting a little too extra around here. But it is sweater weather. Now is precisely the time for extrosity. That's not a word. You have not fallen in with fall. Now is the time for pie spices, and warm colors, and hot drinks, and apple picking. I don't have any free weekends. No, 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 no. Your queen of fall commands you. Hang on, I can fix this. Uh, I, uh, here, actually, could you just hold this for a second? Thanks. I know I've got them around here, so, aha, uh -huh. ah. This is for your own good. Whee! <sighs> well, friends, I guess we're talking about fall. Specifically, Pippins. No, 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 not that Pippin. And not that Pippin either. I mean apples. Wow, where do you begin with apples? Apples are members of the rose family, which includes such favorites as pears, plums, peaches, strawberries, cherries, the list goes on. Now, my favorite Soviet son and yours, the botanist Nikolai Vavilov, who tragically and ironically starved to death in a gulag because Stalin didn't like science that didn't toe the party line, well, he was super interested in species centers of origin, or you might also call them their centers of diversity. He hypothesized that if you find where a species was originally domesticated, that's where you're going to find the greatest amount of genetic diversity among other wild relatives. You can then crossbreed the wild species with the domesticated species and get swell things like greater disease resistance. Which is exactly what you want if you're some bright-eyed Soviet botanist trying to single-handedly end famine. Look, if Vavilov could have punched famine in the face, he totally would have just punched famine in the face. Now, Vavilov, in his many travels, mapped out 12 centers of origin, and he posited that the mountains of Kazakhstan were the ecological birthplace of the modern apple. And he was right! We just wouldn't be able to confirm his theory until... Well, Stalin had to kick the bucket first. Now, some of the last wild apple forests can be found in the Tian Shan Mountains, especially outside of the city of Almaty. So Almaty used to be the capital of Kazakhstan. It's a big cultural center, and throughout its history, it's been called things like Apple Mountain, the father of apples, the big apple. You see where I'm going with this, right? Now, those wild Malus Siversi trees are the progenitors of the modern domesticated apple, the Malus Domestica, like it says on the tin. Now, apples can't just pollinate themselves, and that cross-pollination with other trees means that while you get the same fruit from the same tree, if that fruit drops and a tree grows from those seeds, it's not going to be the same as the parent because of sexual reproduction. You know what, I'm just gonna leave it to your parents to explain this one to you. Or look it up on YouTube. Okay, now I question the saying, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Okay, like, hear me out. Technically, dropped fruit, yes, does not go far from the tree, unless, say, you've got some roving bears or deer or, or humans with their camels and their horses traveling along the Silk Road through Kazakhstan. And then, you know, they eat the apples, and then they transport those seeds 40 miles away, and then, and then that line just keeps going down, and you kick that apple just down the road, so to speak. And then the humans are like, wow, this one particular fruit is really delicious. And we've been practicing, you know, grafting in China and Babylon, you know, for a while. So what if 
we took some graphs. And then you take the graphs, and then you put them on rootstocks, and then you take the rootstocks, and you spread those throughout the ancient world. And that's how you end up with domesticated apples throughout. But that's grafted trees. Seedlings are completely different. Seedlings are like the awkward teenager that's still living at home, and then they realize that their parents voted for Trump, and they're sitting there like, oh my god, how am I related to these people? So really, what you should be saying is, the grafted branch is identical to the parent stock. But I guess that isn't as pithy. North America had native crab apples, not Malus domestica. But then the Europeans came. They just had to clear off all this land that they decided was theirs now. Now those Europeans needed to get things planted fast, especially since apples can take between five to seven years to start fruiting. Sure, grafting is the way to make sure you're getting the variety of apple you want, but they just needed to put things in the ground, so for expediency's sake, they planted seeds, or pips. And apples became a big deal in America. No, I'm not talking about the, huh, did you know John Adams drank hard cider every morning kind of big deal. Okay, here's the thing about John Adams and cider. Yes, he mentioned drinking hard cider in the morning. However, he was only drinking a gill of hard cider, which, depending on if you're using US or UK measurements, comes to about four or five ounces of liquid, which is this mason jar's worth of alcohol. This mason jar is half the standard US serving size for hard cider. So no, John Adams was not getting schwiggity schwasted on hard cider every day. He did, however, enjoy the hell out of Philadelphia beer. One has only to look at the nomenclature of the apple, a catalog of the known varieties referred to in American publications from 1804 to 1904. This 400-page compendium lists all known varieties of apples in America between that time. And once you remove the overlap, this comes out to about, oh, uh, 14,000 different varieties of apples. Some used for cider, some used for baking, some used for drying, some used for being fed to livestock. For comparison, we have about oh, 90 commercially available varieties now. So you're an American colonist, and you're planting pippin trees left and right, and some are really only good for cider and cider vinegar, but that's useful, so that's fine. And, you know, some are good for cooking, so that's also pretty handy. But some, some you can just eat. Thus, we get to the new town Pippin. Now, anyone who has ever discovered a long-forgotten, withered, sad gala apple on their counter, like me, might wonder, how did people get to eat apples in the wintertime without refrigeration? Don't let modern supermarkets fool you. Some apple varieties actually get better if you let them sit in storage for a while. They age like a fine wine. The Newtown Pippin is one of these. Back then it was described as small, green, kind of lopsided, but it was considered perfect for cider making and for desserts. Picked in October, the Newtown Pippin contained extra starches that would convert to sugars over time. Stored properly, old fruit manuals list the Newtown Pippin's eating season as between February and May, making it a perfect winter apple. The Newtown Pippin was discovered around 1730 on Gershon Moore's farm, which was in the town of Newtown. Uh, that town would later be renamed Elmhurst, which becomes relevant in a moment. It was a smashing success among apple affectionados. Thomas Jefferson... It always comes back to Jefferson. Uh, he loved it so much he planted grafted rootstock in Monticello, and while in Paris wrote, they have no apples here to compare with our new town Pippins. In 1838, Andrew Stevenson, who was an American minister serving in the court of St. James, had two barrels of new town Pippins shipped to England and presented them to the newly crowned queen, Victoria. She was so impressed, she lifted an English tax on imported American apples. Gotta get that apple fix, Vicky. By 1898, new town Pippins were commanding almost three times the price of other apples in UK markets. Yeah, Nella, that's fascinating, but where can I eat this apple? You you got me you got me jonesing for apples now. Where where can I find it? So about that. 
So finding a new town Pippin has proven a little harder than I would have liked. People keep telling me you can find them at the Union Square Farmer's Market, but every time I go, I just find bubkis. Look, I know Newtown Pippins have been planted in various New York City parks by the Parks Department since they originated in Queens, New York, but I don't want to go trying to steal fruit from parks trees. I don't want to get on the wrong side of the Parks Department. So here's what happened. I live in Queens. I like it. It's a good borough. And I'm in spitting distance of the area that was once Newtown. And it just so happened that the Elmhurst History and Cemeteries Preservation Society was having one of their history walking tours. And in the walking tours description, they specifically mentioned the history of the Newtown Pippin. So I figured if anyone could tell a gal from Queens where she could get her hands on some Newtown Pippins, it would be these people. Well, the tour was great, and we ended up at the First Presbyterian Church of Newtown, which was founded in 1652. Now, the son of the first pastor just so happened to be Gershon Moore, the guy who discovered the Newtown Pippin in the first place on his farm. Well, I got to meet Marjorie, a delightful lady who made it her personal mission to return the Newtown Pippin to Newtown. She went out of her way to get two trees from Monticello and gifted them to the First Presbyterian Church of Newtown. And then after telling us the history of the church and of the apple itself, she was just like... So are you ready to go see the trees? Yes, Marjorie. Yes, I was born ready. Now, it hadn't been a great harvest year for them. By the time we got there, there were only really two apples left on the branch and one or two sad, mushy ones on the ground. And then Marjorie finds an all right looking apple on the ground and hand to God goes, hey, anybody want an apple? So I got the apple. Yes, Newtown Pippins are supposed to be winter apples, which means I, in theory, should be waiting to eat this until later. But the problem is it's, it's got kind of this blemish here, and there might be a worm in it. So we're just going to cut it open and hope there's no worm in, and see, what, see what's, uh, what the deal with it is. So here we go. Nella's first Newtown Pippin. Just, you know, we'll just cut a... My mother could see me trying to cut this apple right now. She'd be mad. All right. Well, I don't see a worm, so that's good. Huh. That's a nice, that's a nice aroma there. So funny story. Uh, when my aunt was dating her now husband, uh, he came to family dinner in my family Sicilian, and supposedly my great-grandmother was there, and it was after dinner, so it was time for desserts, which really means fruits and nuts. And uh, there were apples on the table, and, and uh, my uncle just sort of grabbed an apple and munched right into it. And supposedly my great-grandmother was so disgusted, she in Sicilian said, he didn't even peel it like an animal. But, you know, my great-grandmother was a woman of opinions. So here we go. Let's try a new town Pippin. That's tasty. Oh, wow. It's uh, it's definitely like, like a Granny Smith, but somehow, it's definitely better. It's really crisp. It's also milder somehow. I was expecting it to be like really kind of tart since it's supposed to like winter, but like this is sweet. Maybe as time has gone on, the variety has sort of gotten, you know, better about that. That's really tasty, huh? Wow, that's a great apple. That's a really good apple. Oh man, I have got to find more of these. Okay, but in all seriousness, if you live in the five boroughs and you know where I can get more of these locally, just, you know, leave a comment below. Pippin Watch 2019. Let's make magic happen, people. You know, the funny thing is, it really smells like Martinelli cider. Like, that's, it, it, it kind of tastes like it, too. I just... Today, one company, S. Martinelli and Company, buys 85% of the Newtown Pippin harvest from the area's 1,500 remaining acres to make juice and sparkling cider. Drinking this apple the whole time?
Son of a... As ever, thank you to my ear lenders, Avi Finkel, Johan Gustafsson, Mario B., William Christopher, Chandra, and Xantha Pink. I sure do hope you folks enjoy your postcards. But let's be real, the rest of you aren't staying to the end of this video just to hear me thank people. No, you're here to see who won the raffle. If you follow my Patreon, you know that I did a little prop shopping, obviously, for this episode, and uh, I had a little contest to see if you guys could guess which mug from Michael's I bought to show on camera, and then the winner of that raffle would have this shipped to them if they, you know, had a proper mailing address. So there were three regular mugs, and then there was this travel mug. I went with the travel mug, and remember this so that you can game the system next time, uh, because this won't break if I ship it. So that's how my brain works. Now you know, and now you can use that knowledge for good or ill, but please use it for good. So there were four possible mugs. So we're doing three different raffles. One is the raffle for the travel mug itself. About eight people voted for this one, so your names are already in here. We're gonna give it a good shake, and then we're gonna pick a name. So, hold on to your butts. All right, I'm reaching in. I'm trying to grab one, just one. I can't divide up this mug like King Solomon. Uh, just wouldn't work. All right, and the winner of the travel mug is William Christopher. Awesome. So, William, I know I definitely have your mailing address, so I will be shipping you uh, the uh, Pumpkin Spice for Life travel mug. May it keep your drinks warm and your memories warmer. So, I mean, one raffle just isn't enough. I mean, this is the house of extrosity. So, we have another raffle for the mug that was voted for the most, which was uh, Sweater Weather is Better Weather? weather? Is that even what it said? Sweater weather is better. Anyway, y'all seem to really like that one. So, uh, like, 13 of you liked it. So, this is, uh, this is going to be a raffle to win the Queen's Favor, which was this little, just a little, little bit, little, little, little thing I made with, uh, I raided my mother's craft supplies, and I made this. So, to wear in the video, so I'll, I will be sending you this as my, as my thanks for voting. Uh, even though you, you voted wrong, but you voted a lot. So, the majority of you voted wrong. And you're gonna get rewarded for that, because that's how democracy works. So, now the vote for the sweater weather mug, which was wrong, but it had the most votes. And the winner of the favor is, we'll just go with John C, you know who you are. And uh, so if I have your mailing address, I will be sending you the favor. Uh, if you don't have a mailing address and don't get me a mailing address by Thanksgiving, I will be picking a runner up, just so you know. And last but not least, the losers losers pile. These are the people who picked either pumpkin spice up your life or my blood type is PSL. This is the hat of participatory prizes. So yeah, uh, I'm a millennial. I'm allowed to, to give those out. Uh, it's my right, and my privilege, and my duty. So, the winner of the third place you tried gold star from your fall queen is Amy Thorne! So Amy, I also know I have your address already, so you'll definitely be getting something in the mail in gratitude. But for everyone else who voted in the raffle and participated, I believe in participatory badges. I think they're fun. So I'll probably be sending you like a postcard. So look out for that specialty postcard because you voted in my Patreon poll. So if you would like to participate in things like this in the future, be sure to follow me on Patreon. Uh, link below. I also have a postcard for my PO box. So here we go. Greetings from Kentucky. Very bright, very shiny. I'm really digging. Is So is the safe flower like goldenrod? Now I'm gonna have to look that up because like it looks like something everyone in my family would be allergic to. But yeah, so the card is from Katie B. And it says, hi Nella. And it's two exclamation points with a smiley face underneath connecting the dots. So that's adorable. I don't have any questions for you. Just wanted to let you know your videos are awesome. Keep up the good work. Thanks Katie. And I really appreciate your card. Thank you for sending it. If you would like to send me a card and have it read out loud in one of my videos, uh, details of the P.O. box are below as well. I love postcards. I love sending postcards. I love getting postcards. So let's just keep that, that ball rolling. And uh, until next time.